Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I am going to talk today about one of the most controversial topics in remote work, which is uh, why I thought this would be interesting, which is about uh, setting compensation for remote employees. If you are uh, a business and you want to hire someone remotely, uh, one, nowadays is not very hard. You know, companies like ours can help you take care of all the bureaucracy. Um, and finding talent is incredibly easy because previously you were just looking for people in the neighborhood and now uh, you can hire the best person on the planet. But now you're faced with a decision. How much do I actually pay that person? And how do I create a policy uh, around that? Uh, ultimately, this is uh, a matter of strategy for business. It's incredibly important that you make a decision about uh, how you're going to address this. If you don't make an early decision, uh, quickly you will run into uh, problems where either some people are undercompensated, maybe other people are overcompensated, or simply you're not able to hire people because uh, you, you, you don't have your compensation framework uh, in place. Uh, and, 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 and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the different schools of thought, like how you can and should maybe compensate uh, your remote uh, employees and how to think about that and what the ups and downsides of, of that are. And in the end, I'll talk a little bit about what I think is a reasonable way to go about this and what I recommend organizations to do. Uh, but let's start at the, at the top. Um, Often what you see is if you ask people, especially people that don't run a business themselves, and you ask them, well, uh, how, how should you, we pay people, right? If you join a company uh, do you think, and the company has people all over the world, how should you reward them? Should they all pay the same? So, you know, independent of whether you live in San Francisco or like me in the middle of nowhere in Portugal, um, if the role is the same and the person has the same amount of experience, should you pay those two people the same uh, amount? And um, there's a good argument to be made here, which is, well, as an organization, you pay for the value that someone contributes. You pay for their experience, you pay for, you know, kind of role they'll be performing. And the location in which that person is, that doesn't really change how they might do the role, especially in a remote organization. It actually doesn't change, right? It might be, um, uh, uh, the person might be doing the exact work. It has the same uh, capabilities independent of where they are on the planet. And so you might say, well, we're gonna pay these people the same wage. You're quickly faced with an interesting problem if you do this, which is how much do you pay everybody? And so, there's a number of organizations that um, follow this kind of model. Um, some organizations say, well, we are going to pay everybody the same. And that same thing is going to be whatever people in the highest end of the market will accept. So that, that is essentially like they take the, the, the median salary of a particular role in San Francisco. It tends to be the most expensive market where the salaries on average are the highest. Um, and if you, if you have a startup, this is a really good way to make sure you can hire the best person in the planet for any given role. And uh, that means that even though someone might have significantly lower cost to live where I live, for example, here in Portugal, um, they benefit from that. And that's their own choice. The downside, of course, as a business is, and this is, uh, you know, easy to, to forget is that as a business, you also have to think about like, how much can I do with the money that I have? And if you make this decision, the, the reality is that you can hire less people, right? And that might be worth it. Uh, it's, it's a valid choice, but it's definitely an important choice to be made. Um, a, a secondary one here is that uh, every single job, but in general, this goes with remote organizations, will have hundreds of applicants because of course, this is a very attractive thing. So in general, uh, this is a great move to do if you want to attract the best talent, if you have the kind of money for that. Um, let's move over to another school of thought, which is adjusting for the cost of living. This is something that we see more and more and um, some companies adopt very uh, deeply and other companies somewhat. So for example, you might know Buffer, the company that has public salaries. I believe that they have a small factor in there adjusting for the cost of living. And what this means is that if you live in a uh, location that is more expensive to live in, for example, the rent index, which is a measure of how expensive on average is rent in a particular location, um, that might determine how you get paid or it might be a variable in calculating how much you get paid. So 
if I live in San Francisco, uh, I might get paid uh, $100,000, but I, if I live in Portugal, maybe I get paid $50,000. This is um, commonly seen as like a relatively good way for organizations to structure their, their compensation for remote employees. Um, the, the reason is, is that, and you could say, well, although people are not equal in this case, people are not equally paid, maybe it's more fair. Because at the end of the day, if you want to live in you know, San Francisco, uh, it's significantly more expensive to live there. What you pay there on rent, uh, you will never pay that on rent in, for example, here in Portugal. The other side of the equation is, and the counter argument for this is, of course, well, living in a particular place is a choice. And if you work remotely, you can really choose where you live. Um, I would argue that this is not the case, actually. It's significantly harder, especially to move across the country. So uh, th I think the choice factor is, is a little bit less strong in that. Generally, I find this a, a reasonably good model to go about it, but it has a few major downsides. And I think one of the biggest downsides in this is what, what is the cost of living? How do you determine that? Because if I choose to live in a tiny apartment in San Francisco and it's very expensive, it's fair to say, well, okay, so it's an expensive place to live. But if I choose to live in a very big one um, and my cost of living is really, really high, then how does the company decide what, what is a fair cost of living and how do we relate this to the salary? This is a really, really complicated uh, thing to, to address. And so one struggle that you quickly find if you adopt this kind of model is we have to forever keep updating it. Like the cost of living is not a stable thing. It changes. It might be different if, whether you live in a city. It might be different whether you live in a countryside. And so you will have to make decisions about, you know, how many regions do we do? Uh, do we do specific for a city or do we do more general for a particular country? It's incred incredibly um, time consuming to keep this updated. And my recommendation is if you want to follow this kind of model, keep it really, really simple. Essentially say, well, either you live in a city or out of city, or you live in the United States or in Europe or uh, in Africa, or, you know, that is roughly the, the vision I would make, and then not worry about anything else. Um, I think the risk about underpaying someone tends to be higher than the risk of overpaying someone. Uh, another way to go about this is to actually build a salary calculator, where you say, well, these are all the variables that go up in building someone's salary, we put those all together and then um, we build a calculator that at the end presents us with a number. Uh, and actually uh, at GitLab, we spent some time building this kind of calculator and there's now several other organizations that follow a similar kind of model. First off, it's important to uh, internally decide if we're going to do this, will everybody be um, compensated according to the salary? And then if not that, what are the exceptions and why are those exceptions? Because the risk of building something like this is that a part of the organization feels like they're stuck with in a particular salary band, for example, whereas another part of the organization might not, this might not apply to. And then what's important to realize is that every part, every variable in that calculation will be inspected and discussed by everyone that it will apply to. And uh, that's completely fair because you might say, someone might decide, well, if you live in Amsterdam, then your total cost of living might be X and your um, uh, the adjustment that we make because of the region is Y, but you might feel that it's very different or it might be different because of the source of the data that they use to make that calculation might not uh, be as close to reality as you want. And this quickly boils down to one thing, which is the more variables you take into account in building a model like this, the more the source of that data is uh, going to be discussed and the more important that source of data is. So if you make a salary, salary calculator that is very simple, what's gonna happen is that it might um, discriminate against particular people or it might um, cause that people won't even apply to your company because they get a very low compensation even though maybe for the specific area that live, the average compensation is much higher but your data doesn't have that kind of resolution um, or it gets very complicated. And if it gets very complicated, it's very hard to keep up to date. So salary calculators are a really awesome tool to do this, but they're super hard to do. And you have to imagine that the larger your organization gets, and the more serious you are about doing this, 
the more time and money you will have to invest in building something like this, whatever the variables are. Ultimately, when you think about compensation frameworks, it's about managing expectations. Uh, and with that, I mean creating an expectation externally and internally about how people are going to be compensated and what they should expect. Um, and at the same time, if you are in, in charge of hiring people, if you're starting a startup, you want to hire a whole bunch of people, uh, it, it's very important to uh, start with what do we hope to achieve? Because the reality is, is that if you want to hire and your, your hiring policy is, you know, we're fully remote and we want to hire the best person, the, it's very simple. You'll have to pay the most. And so your compensation framework will have to essentially nail down, come down to, well, we'll have to pay people whatever they want, right? Because if you want to hire the best person on the planet and you're inflexible about the kind of compensation that you can offer, that's, that's going to stop you from hiring that person. And then you're not, you're not being uh, realistic about how you're setting this up. One thing that I've seen organizations do is they say, well, we are going to cap it or we are specifically targeting not the most expensive markets. So in hiring people, we look for people that um, don't live and don't want to live in the most expensive area. So we, they might uh, not live in San Francisco, but maybe uh, we pay up until the levels of larger metropolitan areas elsewhere in the United States. And that is the, the, the ceiling that we set. Uh, this is a really good way of going about things it still remains important to think about like how are we going to do it for the rest of the compensation but it's a really good framework because then you're being realistic to yourself and you're being realistic internally and say well we just simply can't you know pay two three hundred thousand dollars for an engineer even though this person might be amazing uh, that's simply not the range in which we can act um, and generally i think this is a a smart approach to say, well, we're going to cap it at a particular way. Because what you will avoid by doing it like that is that there's large income discrepancies, which tend to favor uh, particular groups of people and disfavor others. Um, and then lastly, what I would say is that because, you know, if you're truly hiring all over the world, standards are very different. I think as an employer, if you are in a position of hiring people and thinking about compensation and setting compensation, this is really your chance to make a difference. And with that, I mean, if you can hire someone in an area that is really low cost or where salaries tend to be really low, um, you, don't, you don't have to do that. And so my recommendations, recommendation is set a global minimum. Say anybody that works for us is going to earn at least this value, let's say forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. That means that if we hire someone for a very low cost area that might have previously earned significantly less than um, what we are offering, we are always at least going to pay them uh, a, a particular amount, no matter what it is that they ask for, no matter what they expect. Of course, the best way that is, is most fair is to say, well, this is a range that we pay people in a particular position and it doesn't matter where they live. Of and again, going back to my earlier point, that's not always realistic, but I would strongly suggest if you are in a position to make these kind of decisions, set a global minimum and pay people what uh, they deserve to be paid, not just because their rent might be very cheap. And uh, that is really the message that I wanna to give to you. We are now in an age where you can hire the best person in a planet, you can create opportunities in every corner. It, it doesn't matter anymore uh, where you live, where you've grown up, where you studied. Independent of location, you can find amazing work and you can build amazing companies. It's up to, it's up to the employers to create some equality in that and to help people earn more money, build more wealth. Um, and if you, of course, if you need any help with employing people and taking care of all the bureaucracy, uh, remote can help with that. If you have any questions or you want to discuss with it further with me, uh, find me on Twitter or, or send me directly an email. Thank you very much.